So Kyle, how many years of experience do you have in the uh, security field? Uh, approximately 30, sir. And how many years did you serve at the State Department in that, uh, in that same area? Almost 23. Did you get good evaluations, uh, high, uh, high reviews, strong reviews? Yes, sir. Uh, so good, in fact, I looked at your resume that you actually were put on the security detail to protect the Secretary of State. Is that accurate? Yes, sir, Secretary Warren Christopher and Madeleine Albright. Protected two secretaries of state. And then your most recent service in the public sector was as Assistant Secretary at Homeland Security. Is that right? Yes, sir. And that's an appointment from the Obama administration? Yes, sir. You trust the agents in the field, Mr. Kyle? I trust them implicitly. They know they have the best perspective. They know the ground truth. They know what's going on. on so their assessment, their instincts, they're the guys on the ground putting their, putting their lives on the line just like you did. So when they make a recommendation to the State Department, you take that seriously? Yes, I would. And are you familiar with the fact that the guys on the ground in Benghazi repeatedly ask for additional security and were repeatedly denied? Yes, sir, from what we saw. Routinely denied. They said, we need, look, this, this thing's out of control. We need, some, we need some more good guys here. And repeatedly asked for that, repeatedly denied. And it was worse than that, wasn't it, Mr. Kyle? Mm, possibly, yes, sir. Yeah, because what they asked for now... They said, we need more, but what they had was actually reduced. Yes. Is that accurate? Yes. We, we heard about a year and a half ago testimony from Colonel Wood, who was on the ground in Benghazi, and he said this, quote, we were fighting a losing battle. We couldn't even keep what we had. Now, Mr. Cobb, my, my guess is, you know, we've heard there's, we got, we're the United States of America. We got facilities all over the globe. And my guess is at every facility, the security people would say, we could use a few more folks here. We'd like a few more. My guess is that that happens. But wasn't the situation in Libya and Benghazi somewhat unique? So when you look at the intelligence, the threat reporting, the deteriorating security environment, and the numerous incidents, yeah, I, I, I would prioritize Benghazi. Some have talked about We had IED attacks, RPG attacks, atta assassination attempt on the British ambassador. I mean, this is as bad as it gets. And they said, we need more gu good guys here. And the State Department says, no, you're not going to get that. In fact, we're going we're to reduce what you had. If you were an agent on the ground in Benghazi at the time, Mr. Kai, would you, be, would you have been lobbying for more help to come to Benghazi? I'd probably be doing more than lobbying. I'd be extremely frustrated and try to push every button I could possibly push. Flip it around. You're the guy at the desk in Washington. You get the request from these guys on the ground for more help. Would you have fought to make that request happen? Uh, as a matter of fact, sir, my last position with DS, I was the regional director for a DS regional bureau vetting those requests from the field. I would have uh, put a significant amount of priority on Benghazi requests. Oh, so you had that job? Yes. Before, before the Benghazi, you had that job? Correct. And you would have went to bat for these folks? Yes, I would have. Mr. Kyle, what's the Overseas Security Policy Board? Uh, Overseas Security Policy Board, it's an interagency board that uh, is, is the genesis from the Beirut Embassy bombings, the Inman Commission, which created the Diplomatic Security Service, the Inman Standards. It's an interagency board that creates uh, physical security, technical security, procedural security requirements. So these were, the these were standards developed interagency. Inter so they're the State Department standards, is that correct? State Department, OSPB. And this resulted from the embassy bombing in Beirut where 63 people were killed, 17 Americans. Yes, sir. And were the standards followed at the Benghazi facility? Sir, we saw a memo which authorized the continuing opening of the Benghazi mission, which, which referred to it as the special mission compound. And talking with people, and based on my experience, it was a purposeful effort to skirt the standards. So the standards weren't followed? No. Now, my understanding is uh, there's a waiver process that you have to follow if, in fact, you're going to deviate from the standards. Was the waiver process followed? Uh, that was one of our recommendations, sir. And when you're not following the standards, you don't have to follow the waiver process either. So then follow the standards or the waiver? Correct. Mr. Kyle, what, what, what's, your, what's your overall impression of the ARB report? Uh, Mr. Sullivan and I testified before the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Ambassador Pickering referred to the ARB as being fiercely independent. In that same hearing, Admiral Mullen admitted to Oversight and Government Reform that uh, he was reporting on ARB proceedings to the senior staff of the State Department outside of the, the precepts and the requirements of being a member of the ARB. Um, I don't think that fits anyone's definition of being fiercely independent. Do you don't think it was independent at all? Not based on uh, what was Frankly, I share, I share your belief. I mean, when, when, the Secretary, when Secretary Clinton gets to appoint the, the co-chairs of the board, when Cheryl Mills calls them up and asks them to serve, when neither Secretary Clinton or Cheryl Mills are interviewed, 
when they get a draft report before it goes public, in essence, they get to edit the report before the rest of the world gets to see it. Uh, and as you point out, when Admiral Mullen told the committee, told the committee, he, now think about this, he's been on the job a few days as the co-chair of the supposedly independent ARB, been on the job a few days, he interviews Charlene Lamb, he discovers that Charlene Lamb is going to two days later come in front of the oversight committee, and he realizes she's not going to be a good witness. What's he do? Just what, you, just what you referenced, Mr. Kyle. He gets on the phone and calls the chief of staff to the secretary of state and says, hey, Charlene Lamb's not going to be a good witness. She's not going to reflect well on the State Department. He gives a heads up to the very person he's supposed to be investigating. So, of course, this thing wasn't independent. I mean, think about we, – we asked Mr. Mullen, why do you care whether she's a good witness or a bad witness? Your job is to get to the truth for the American people and for the families of those four individuals who lost their lives, not to give a heads up to the higher-ups at the State Department. So it was anything but independent. But here's – there was one good thing that came out of the ARB, in my judgment, at least one good thing. They created the best practice panel that you and Mr. Sullivan sat on, right? Yes. And you guys made a whole bunch of recommendations. Yes. How many recommendations again? Forty recommendations. Forty recommendations, and some of them are more important than others. Is that right? Yes. And the most important one is which one? The creation of an undersecretary for diplomatic security. In fact, sir, in our executive summary, we said one clear and overarching recommendation. It's crucial to the successful and sustainable implementation of all of the recommendations in this report is the creation of an undersecretary. And is that the first recommendation you listed in your it's report? recommendation number one. So it's recommendation number one. Most of the others hinge on the implementation of that recommendation. Yes, sir. It's designed to give accountability and responsibility to one particular person at the State Department. Is that correct? Uh, to, to identify those who are. Yeah, something Ms. Brooks yes, talked about in her Ms. Ms. Brooks talked about in her opening questions. Yes, sir. Designed to give accountability and responsibility to someone at the State Department. And is this the first time that this recommendation has been put forward, Mr. Kyle? No, sir. Our board was, or our panel, excuse me, was was a bit surprised to actually uncover a memo from now 15 years ago that Secretary of State Madeleine Albright had signed after the East African Embassy bombings, during uh, the creation of an undersecretary for diplomatic security. So, so we have the Overseas Security Policy Board created after Americans were killed in Beirut. Yes, that wasn't followed. We have a recommendation from Madeleine Albright, the lady you protected that says we need to create an undersecretary after people, Americans, were killed in the East African embassy bombings. Yes, sir. And that wasn't followed. I mean, has the State Department said they're going to implement this at all? Uh, they said it's one of the recommendations they are not going to implement. They're not going to implement it. They're not going to implement it. My question is real simple, Mr. Chairman. What's it going to take? What's it, what's it going to take for the State Department to put in place the practices that are going to save American lives? They didn't listen to the guys on the ground the pros who know what they're doing in a situation that anyone looks at and says, wow, we need more Americans there to help. They didn't listen to the guys on the ground and put their lives on the line. They didn't follow their own standards that were developed in 1983 after the Beirut embassy bombing. They didn't follow the waiver process to deviate from those standards. And now they're not following the best practices panel's number one recommendation. What's it going to take? The, 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 the ranking member in his opening, in his opening remarks said this is a transformational moment. Well, somebody better tell the State Department that. Because, I mean, think of this track record. I hope it is a track. I, I hope the members are right. I hope they, they get it. But if they're not going to listen to two guys with the experience that Mr. Kyle and Mr. Sullivan have and say the one thing we need, the one main thing we need is this, under, this, this, this person of accountability, the one main thing how, that, that, that everything else hinges on, I mean, talk about the arrogance of the State Department. So hopefully one of the things we can, this, this committee can do is at least convince them to follow these guys, what they said. At least convince them of that. Mr. Kyle, thank you for your service. It's an amazing record what you've done for our country. Mr. Sullivan, yours as well. We appreciate the work on the best practices panel. 42 seconds I would, I would give. Why don't you ask the State Department? I mean, you, you can ask him that question. Yeah. The way this works, what, I think what's Mr. Your, what is your, reclaiming, reclaiming what, my time, that, that's... You're welcome to do it, Mr. Chairman. I think you spent a lot of time on Mr. Starr. I, I chose to focus on Mr. Kyle, who's got 30 years of experience, appointed by the Obama administration, 23 years in the State Department, viewed so highly that he was actually on the protective detail for Secretary of State Warren Christopher, Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. I chose to use my 10 minutes on Mr. Kyle. The minority can use their 10 minutes on whoever witness they want. In fact, this was a hearing they called. You can, you can handle however you want.